Our scripture lesson this morning comes from Psalm 112. Praise the Lord. Blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments. His offspring will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in his house, and his righteousness endures forever. Light dawns in the darkness for the upright. He is gracious, merciful, and righteous. It is well with the man who deals generously and lends, who conducts his affairs with justice, for the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. His heart is steady. He will not be afraid until he looks in triumph on his adversaries. He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His horn is exalted in honor. The wicked man sees it and is angry. He gnashes his teeth and melts away. The desires of the wicked will perish. I think probably the, the interesting thing about that psalm that always strikes me is that for nine verses, everything is fixated and focused on God and those who trust God and the great mercies and blessings that come with that, the, the joy and the life, the peace, everything that comes with that relationship of God being in his righteousness. And then there's that last verse, right? And it's kind of like you play this great song and then the last verse, it kind of just, ooh, <laughs> it just stings you, right? Because the last thing it's, hey, the wicked are going to perish away. It's all going to go, that for them, it's going to go away. Well, how do we make sense of that? It's very much about God's ways versus the human ways. Part of dying to self is to step away from those things and to embrace God's ways of doing things. Which, by the way, it's not always as easy as it seems. It's not always as easy as it seems. Well, there are certainly a lot of things going on in our world today. Um, and a lot of things that, that we need to, need to certainly trust God with. So let us, as, as a group, let us pray together, please. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we first come to you to confess our sins before you. We know and acknowledge we've not done things right. We know we've sometimes lost our self-control. We know sometimes we've not been as steadfast as we need to be. So Lord God, we confess our sins before you and pray humbly for your forgiveness. Show mercy to us, Lord God, so that we could live into the life that you have promised us through Jesus Christ. Lord, this is my prayer. Heavenly Father, we lift up to you these prayer concerns that have been spoken. Lord, there are There's more going on, Lord, than we can even comprehend and handle. And so, Lord, we have to turn to you, knowing that we cannot do it all ourselves, to know the difficulties of each specific situation. And so for those things that we have mentioned, Lord, and for those things that are on our hearts right now, we offer prayers to you. Heavenly Father, our life is not our own. You have created us. You put us together in a very special and intricate way. You have made creation. You have given us a place to live. You've given us time and space to exist. And all along the way, you invite us to a real relationship with you that brings life. And it is in Jesus that you came to bring that message clearly. And so it is in our thoughts of Jesus, that we pray the prayer that he taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Will you pray with me? Oh God, open my heart and my mind so I can hear your word and know your will for my life. And then give me the courage to go from this place and live it. Amen. Our gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 17, verse 14 through 21. And when they came to the crowd, a man came up to him and kneeling before him said, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he has seizures, and he suffers terribly. For often he falls into the fire, and often into the water. And I brought him to your disciples, and they could not heal him. And Jesus answered, O faithless and twisted generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the boy was healed instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, Why could we not cast it out? He said to them, Because of your little faith. For truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. The word of God for the people of God. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good morning again. Since we haven't been gathered together here, and since I have not, uh, we obviously didn't record the outdoor worship service, um, and I apologize, uh, Sweets or Wesleyan live streamed the service last week. Um, They sent out a link um, to the service on YouTube, so I will make sure to get that on our blog page. so that you can see that. It's the entire service, so uh, if you just want to fast forward to see the the cool pastor, you can do that too. Um, They they were in the beginning, the end. I don't know about the rest of it, but anyway. Um, But it was a really great worship service. It was really a great time. Um, But I wanted to kind of just go over and remind us a little bit about where we are in terms of what we're studying this year. The foundation, of course, comes from 1 Peter. We're talking about how we're supplementing our faith, how we are improving and making our faith better. And we've gone through things like talking about knowledge and talking about our self-control. And so the sermon series we're talking about now is to be steadfast. Two weeks ago when we were outside, the message was about being steadfast in our conviction for Jesus. That we know without a shadow of a doubt that Jesus is the Savior and he is important to us. He's important to us for everyday life. There has to be a conviction to that. That we know without a shadow of a doubt that is important and has to be a priority. So last week, I won't spoil it all, but the bottom line what we're trying to talk about was purpose. That as Christians, we are called to be players And the metaphor that we were using was talking about like a football stadium and the crowds. And we're talking about all the different types of people that come and gather around the game. And the reality is far too many people in churches, they're fans of Jesus, but they don't want to be players. Jesus is calling people to be players. Pastor Matt gave the, the, the number. He said, when you look at the New Testament, The number of times the word disciple comes up is over 270 times. To be a disciple, 270 times. Do you know how many times the word Christian shows up? Three. So the question you ask yourself is, am I a disciple or am I a Christian? And which one is the greater priority? I know some of us, our logical thinkers, are like, well, if I'm a Christ follower and that makes me a Christian, that's how the world sees me, so I'm a Christian. I get that. But far too often, we don't go far enough in our faith. We stay in our little shell. We hide in our little spot. We try to just remain comfortable, and we forget. We're not called to just sit here. 
We're called to be here to worship. But your ministry is when you leave this place and when you go to work and when you go have fun with friends or you do things with your family or you go support events. That is your mission field. This community is your mission field. Today, I want to give us a reminder about being steadfast in our faith. Steadfast in our faith. You know, the word steadfast is an adjective. It is describing how we are to be with our faith. Firmly fixed in place, immovable, firm in our belief, our determination, and our adherence. You know what I think of when I think about being fixed on something, being solid? Anchors. I know, the pastor's gonna bring an anchor reference to a bunch of farmers. No, that's not funny. I guess you guys got boats someplace I don't know about. You know, land got, oh, okay, fine, move on. I've used some of those anchors before. When I was a kid growing up, my grandparents had a cabin in Canada. We'd go up there every year. Sometimes I'd spend a week, sometimes it was two weeks, kind of depended upon, obviously, my parents' schedule. And I was usually the only kid up there. There weren't a whole lot of cabins, and so I entertained myself most of the time. But Grandma was the fisherman. She was good. And there were times we'd go out and we'd anchor in little spots and she'd go catch minnows. Huge old net, you just sink it down there, you throw the oatmeal in, you yank it up, you get a whole bunch of minnows and you scoop them up, put them in. And then the next day, you go take all those minnows and you go fish. Well, the reality out on the lake up there was, you know, there were certain spots. There were a couple of them that were grandma's spots and she wouldn't share them with the neighbor, I don't know why. But there were spots where you could go find good fish. But we had to anchor in place because if we didn't anchor in place, we'd start drifting in towards the rocks and that'd become a problem and then you gotta try to deal with that. Sometimes the anchor wouldn't always catch, but usually it would hook onto something. I think in all my years up there, we only lost one anchor where we couldn't unhook it. Anyway, but the, what's the job of the anchor? It's to hold you in place, to keep you anchored onto something. And you, know, you can't be anchored if the anchor doesn't hook onto something solid. Now, I learned this the other way. In more recent years, my in-laws had bought a little lake cottage up at Lake George. Anybody ever heard of Lake George? Right on the Indiana-Michigan border. Border just splits the lake in half. So sometimes you're in Indiana, sometimes you're in Michigan. Well, it's really like a ski lake. It's real small, and it's just ski boats and tubes and jet skis, and you could go swim. You could fish in it, but eh, it was a little more difficult. But anyway, there were parts of that lake, even out in the middle, where it was only like 10, 15 feet deep. And so we could take a pontoon boat out there, drop anchor, and then we could just swim around off the boat and jump in and stuff with the kids. It was a lot of fun. But the problem was this lake was a little different because it was really soft and silty at the bottom. You ever been to any of those lakes? Yeah, okay. So you know that if you get a lot of boats churning around or you get a real windy day, you get waves going all of a sudden and you're swimming and the boat just seems to be getting further away from you. <laughs> and sometimes that anchor doesn't hold anything. It's just it's on this soft ground that just kind of moves and you got to get up and try to relocate yourself. I don't know whatever brought me to this, but in many of my years of teaching, especially towards the last four or five where God got hold of me, the message I tried to give to my kids more than anything else was that you have got to figure out what to anchor your life to. Not just having an anchor, but what do you anchor it to? And the reason I would tell these high school kids this was because when they go off to college, their world gets a lot bigger, amen? Amen. Because you get people from all over the place, come with all different kinds of ideas and backgrounds. And the one thing, at least in my college experience, was it was people's ability to rationalize why marijuana was so good and it was okay. And that you had some, peop you had some people that could talk about marijuana like fine china. I mean, they could get in and they would get magazines, oh, look at this, you know, all these different stuff. And whether it was that, whether it was drinking, or whether it was any other part of college life or anything like that, or even if they didn't go to college, the bottom line is, is you're going to come up against waves in life. You're going to come up against things that are going to cause you to question what you're believing in because they're going to present something that sounds good. 
Sounds maybe similar to what you've heard in the past, but hey, oh, this is actually okay, and it's okay because of this, this, and this, but something in you, you're like, I don't know. But if you're not anchored to something, if you haven't taken time to understand what you truly believe in and who you believe in, those waves have a chance of really pushing you in places you don't want to be. And so I think of that metaphor, and I think about what it means to be steadfast in faith. It means to be anchored strong and securely in what God tells us and, most importantly, who God is. See, you can learn all you want to about God. You can study the Bible and all that. But it's diving into the relationship and understanding of who He is that truly matters. A couple weeks ago, I gave you the verse about what faith really means, right? Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Yeah, we're putting our faith in a God that we don't necessarily see. But I'm telling you, you can see him at work. You can witness every day God doing things in people's lives, maybe even in your own life. You can see things being transformed. Our gospel lesson today is kind of an interesting little... um, conversation. There's a problem. Jesus had been up on the mountain with Peter, James, and John. That's where the transfiguration took place. While that was happening, remember, Jesus beforehand had sent out the disciples. And Jesus gave them authority to cast out demons from people, to heal people, to go do real stuff. And they come down the mountain, and here they are, and here the disciples come, and here this guy comes. And he's like, my son has been suffering from this for a long, long time. And it's caused him injuries and harm. Heal him. Your disciples couldn't. And so Jesus, well, he heals him. But it's interesting what he points out. When the disciples went to him afterwards, he said, because of your little faith, truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. So let me take the perspective of a child for a second. Some children would read that and they would take the very literal meaning of it. They'd go out to that pile of rocks out there and they'd say, move, move over there. I believed, why didn't the mountain move? Right? You've had kids ask tough questions before like that, right? There's even a lot of adults that'll look at that, especially adults who are not Christian. They might look at that and they say, so I should have this massive power if I just believe, right? Is that really what's being said here? Is that really the important lesson that I'm going to shout at a mountain and tell it to move and it's going to move? Is that really what Jesus' point is here? I don't think so. There are three parts in this particular line in Jesus' response that we need to take just a brief note of. Number one is notice that he is rebuking their unbelief. He's telling them that they have little faith. What he's really saying is, You are holding on to things of the world. You are not fully trusting in me. You don't have full confidence that this is going to be done or that I truly gave you the power to go do this. You notice that's also kind of an association of how he's talked to many of the Pharisees before, how he's talked about this generation of people that he was dealing with and their lack of faith. The second point I might bring out is that of the mustard seed. The smallest of all seeds that grows into the biggest of all trees. The mustard seed. Is Jesus telling us that you can have this kind of weak and flip-floppy kind of faith that, you know, that's what he means by the smallest of seed? No. Faith like the grain of a mustard seed. That you have strong faith. It can be this small. But big things can happen. Because your small faith and trust in Jesus is putting your faith and trust in a very big God 
who can do very big things. I had a meeting uh, conversation this week with um, Stan Myers. Stan Myers is the Youth for Christ uh, leader here in Oak Hill. And we had a great conversation, talked about a great many things. One of the parts of the conversation he was talking about that, you know, obviously a big part of his job is finding financing for himself to do the, the work he's doing. He is, in fact, very much like a missionary in our schools. And he's a great guy, he's a great example, and he's, he's doing wonderful work, and I, and I love trying to work with him. He said in one of their recent meetings, they were really emphasized the point of praying for things specifically. And one of the directors about a couple weeks ago was praying very specifically to God. He said, God, I need a five-digit check. We need something right now. I need a five-digit check. Do you know what came within a week from someone that they had no real connection with? Not a previous donor. They got a $10,000 check. Now, hold on. Before everybody's like, you tell me to pray for money? <laughs> I don't know. Talk about praying for need. God's going to give you what you need. It's not about want. That money wasn't for him specifically. It was for the ministries and the things that they were doing. The point of the story is understanding that when we go to God, we've got to have the type of faith to know He is going to deliver and He can do things in big ways. We can ask for the smallest little of things and God will do something much more amazing than that. That's the point we're getting at. That's His point with the mustard seed. Just have that faith. And I can do big things. As far as moving mountains... If it's God's will to move a mountain, and God will move a mountain. The bigger point for us is the obstacles that are in our life. To have that trust, to know that he will guide us through. He will help us move through, navigate, set aside the obstacles and problems. Those things that are insurmountable that we look at and we go, there's no way I can get that done. There's no way we could do that in that short of a time. How is this going to work? Our God is a big God, amen? And he will do big things. Pray for something. Pray specific. And see if God doesn't go to work. So now here's the, here's the challenge, right? It's the question of the little girl from Vacation Bible School and from all people. Well, pastor, I prayed and I prayed and I prayed. And what I'm praying for didn't happen, didn't come true. Well, what's the response to that? Does that mean God doesn't love you? Does that mean God's not listening to you? Part of the whole point of faith is to know that we are putting our faith in the person that knows best, the person that has the power to do things but the person who knows exactly what it is we need. We may think we need one thing. We may, need, we may think we need healing of something, but that might not be the real thing God knows we need healing of. We're putting our faith, we're putting our trust in Him. We pray specifically, we pray boldly, but we also are putting our trust and our faith in Him to what He is able to do. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely right. So let me give you three things, I'm talking about being steadfast in faith. And I'm going back to the definition of what it means to be steadfast. It starts with belief. And I'm saying this as being trusting God's word over the sayings of man. So in other words, God's wisdom over human logic. Now God gave us reason. He gave us a brain. Don't ever think that I've ever said, leave your brain at the door. No. Faith is a matter of heart and brain. Okay? But my point is, is we can really get off track sometimes when we start trusting our own reasoning, our own rationale, as we try to make sense of things without seeking God in the process. If we're not seeking God before we as a congregation or we as individuals go forward to do something, then we're making a mistake. 
We should, we should be thinking of God and praying to God before, during, and after. When we make our rationales about how we use our time, how we use our resources, because I'm going to tell you what, God's way of doing things is not ours. Our idea of generosity is not God's way of generosity. And God has been generous to every one of us. Amen? <laughs> How many people were at Joyce's funeral? A handful of people. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, have you ever heard a funeral message that focused on Job? Just kind of curious. <laughs> That's what she wanted. A lot of things didn't go right in Job's life, amen? I mean, he faced excruciating situations and problems. But his faith was still in God. Whether it was good or whether it was bad, he trusted God in all things. And that was the connection for Joyce. She trusted God in all things. She'd had heartache in her life, no doubt. There had been ups and downs, and there had been the physical things. But her faith and trust was in him. Because getting through something or getting through a certain part of life was not the end game. Being healed of something in this time, while we all want that, the greatest healing is for the next time. And that's where we look forward to. That's where our eyes are. Bottom line is sometimes we can talk ourselves out of that. So we've got to believe and trust God's word. We also need to have determination we need to pursue God even when it's not popular or comfortable. I go back to Psalm 12, 6 and 7. For the righteous will never be moved. He will be remembered forever. He is not afraid of bad news. His heart is firm, trusting in the Lord. I mean, that is Job, right? To deal with everything he dealt with, to be able to stand up again and say, nope, God provided Maybe this time God took away. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know why this happened. We don't know why things happen sometimes. And we don't always get an answer that we want or that satisfies us. But our faith says, God, I trust you. I know you will see me through. As I told the kids, life is not about being comfortable. If we are only comfortable doing certain things with God in certain places at certain times, then we're missing God's call and we're missing a lot of things that God wants to lead us into. A lot of amazing things that God wants us to do. I felt that pressure for, for being in schools or other places where you're just really not sure about how much of your faith you can share, who wants to hear it. And if it makes somebody else uncomfortable, well, I don't want to really talk about faith because it might make that person over there uncomfortable. I'm curious. If it's somebody who's not a churchgoer or doesn't know Jesus Christ or have a relationship and you speak of Jesus and it makes them uncomfortable, is it because you're making them uncomfortable or is there a conviction in their heart about, wait a minute, this Jesus person sounds really interesting and I certainly haven't been doing anything to seek that relationship. And they try to run away from it. Is saying the name Jesus really offensive? Am I offending somebody by saying the name of Jesus and what Jesus means and who he is? Is that really on me for making them uncomfortable? Hmm. Ponder that. It also comes to that word of adherence. Whoo, that, that, that could be a sermon itself, right? About how we adhere to what God's doing. How many people adhered to God's word this week? All the time, 100% of the time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> funny how those hands shift around. Yes, I hear. Yes, I was. Yes, we were praying. Yes, we did. Oh, well, you know, there was that one time. Remaining steadfast in the word. I, you, only, you only develop the relationship if you spend time in the relationship. Amen? God gives you a lot of avenues to do that. I'm telling you, one of the best ones is being with other people and allowing the conversation to get around Jesus. Not just about the daily uh, news. Not, oh, please don't do that. But if you do, where's Jesus in it? Where's Jesus calling you in it? 
It is pretty awful. But, you know, even with all the awfulness of the daily news, let's also remember where God is in that because we can see the bad, but there's always the good. The hurricane is bad. There are people that are going to be drastically affected in New Orleans right now. We know that. It's a big storm. They've had big storms before. It's going to be a challenge. But watch what happens afterwards. Watch the groups of people, especially Christian organizations, that respond and come in to do the best job that they can. And it maybe isn't perfect, but they're doing the best job they can to help people. If there's one thing that has come out of the United Methodist Church that is really, really good, it's the UMCOR. It is that group that responds. Teams of people from all over that will go and respond to help the basic needs and help people get back on track. People respond. And that's a good thing. I want to close with something out of Isaiah. He was kind of a big deal, kind of a big time prophet, I guess. You know, we kind of lift him up. I think Jesus quoted him a few times to try to remind people about exactly what Isaiah had prophesied about was happening. In chapter 26, this is just uh, in the part where Isaiah is speaking. And in the chapter before, he speaks about God's victory over death. Uh, Spoiler alert, that victory over death is found in Christ's resurrection. Amen? Okay. So in verse 26, 1 through 4, he's, Isaiah is saying, this is the song that's going to be sung. He says, we have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. I remind you the term nation. It's not about a country. A nation is about a people. It is about a people of faith that are being let in. The righteous nation. We, ha we have a chance to be a part of the righteous nation in Jesus Christ. And he shifts. He says, you keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. God, let me rephrase that last line. God keeps peace him in peace whose mind is focused on God. When we focus on that relationship, when we put our trust in him, he provides the perfect peace. Doesn't mean we don't deal with problems, but we can be at peace because we know who has us. We can get through it. Yeah. Now let me go to that very last line, the everlasting rock. Greek has different, and Hebrew, different terms for rocks. When he says the Lord God is an everlasting rock, he's not talking about the little stone you put that's decorative in your flower beds. We're talking about the word usage here of a rock, like a mountain, like a massive piece of earth that does not move. Okay, It's those things that you climb, that you can't move yourself. It's impossible for you to move. The Lord is an immovable rock. Who he is and his nature is strong and it's solid. But he's not rough. It's not jagged. You're thinking about the immovability. And that is where you put your anchor. You put your anchor to that rock. That's what it hooks on to. So that no matter what you deal with, no matter the tragedies, no matter the joys, no matter the different conversations, the different ways of thinking, you always have yourself anchored to the truth. To remain steadfast, to be firm in our knowledge, to be firm in our self-control, the conviction, the purpose of our life, steadfast in the faith in Jesus. Let us pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we invite your Holy Spirit into our hearts. We want you to examine us, Lord God, and to show us those areas of our life that we have not put in your hands, that we've not turned over to you. Help us, Lord, to get rid of any of our excuses for why we don't show up when you call us. Help us, Lord God, to see the places 
where you can use me, even when I don't feel qualified. Let me accept that invitation, Lord God, to be yours and to follow you, to trust that you are the great provider of all things and that you are faithful. Let me anchor to your faithfulness, Lord God, that I can be the light to those around me. We thank you for your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior, now and forever. Amen.